Today we're doing a listener active. Today we're doing a list. Today we're doing a listener requested episode. We're going to be talking about active imagination, what it is, and how to do it. I love active imagination. It is very important in my practice, and it is something that I think will help a lot of people out. There are some misnomers about what it is. We're going to talk about that together as we walk down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie, I am a Christopagan druid and priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian, and I make funny faces that distract Charlie sometimes. A lot, actually. Today we're going to be talking about active imagination, what it is, where it came from, and how you can do it to better your life in so many ways. This is a very good practice to get into, and one that's really good to do with friends, kinda. Active imagination groups are good. We'll talk about all of it in just a minute. But before we get into it, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is, on the app that you're currently listening to us on. We noticed that we have a bunch of new people listening to us on Audible. So hi! hi. Uh, hope you continue to enjoy the episodes. We do five original creation spirituality, druidic, and Christopagan episodes every week monday through friday and we got a lot of exciting stuff coming up and you don't want to miss a thing and like with this episode you can always request things and help you maybe get it onto the schedule for us to record all right so let's get to it active imagination is a technique that was developed by carl jung at the very end of his working relationship with Freud, as he was starting to dabble in our unconscious mind uses symbols to communicate with us he was looking for a way to be able to actively engage with our unconscious mind. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's back there in the background doing things. We sometimes get a hint of it through feeling sensations, but how can you have a direct line to it? And so he developed a methodology and that works and it can be very valuable and very helpful. But before we talk about the methodology, a few little caveats. One, if you are prone to flights of fancy, make sure that you have somebody in your life that knows that you are doing this pro process. You are going to be very deeply engaging with your imagination. If you're somebody who's stuck in their head, in their imagination, if you're a daydreamer, it might be good to let people know so that they can help you if you get stuck in there. Not a common thing that happens, but is a thing that can happen. So just cover your bases, make sure that you have somebody that you can talk to. Also, this is a good practice to do with a therapist. If you are currently seeing a therapist, maybe ask them their opinions on active imagination and how it will affect any of the processes you are currently going through. Not that it could have a ma major impact from a lot of my understanding, but if you're doing um, internal family systems therapy or something like that, there's a lot of interconnected practices in there and you don't want to get everything jumbled up. If you are currently working with a therapist, you may want to talk to your therapist and just make sure that you're not going to be messing up what they're working with you on. There's that. Three, don't take any of this too seriously. I say this a lot with spiritual work and everything, but you are not going to be talking to the universe. You're talking to the unconscious bits of yourself. You're literally talking to the AI machine that you have in the back of your head that's desperately trying to cobble together a meaningful worldview in the background while you're going around living your conscious life. You're only really going to be able to pull out what you've already put in. Be warned, we're not doing this to seek divine truth and revelation. And I want to make that clear because I think a lot of people experience instances of active imagination and confuse them for divine revelation. That is not what's going on here. Even if it feels to you like that's happening, I have had experiences in active imagination where I have had brilliant experiences of meeting angels and archangels and what have you that were all in my mind. I have had spiritual experiences. I will say, as somebody who has been practicing these arts for a very long time, for like 30 years, there's a difference in how they feel and how they are processed in your brain. When dealing with an external spirit, it feels very external. This will should feel very internal but even if it does feel external remember we are doing an imaginative process 
it is internal, whatever it feels like. This may be your first experiences and learning what it feels like to have this deep dialogue with yourself. I just want you to bear all of that in mind before we get into the technique itself. Okay. We got all that covered. Just remember when you're hollering to the work crew on the other side of the giant sarcasm, they're going to hear it differently. I'm half joking around about it, bringing a reference to inside out too, but, but you really are. You're going way back into the depths of your psyche. I love that you brought that up because you're making a joke about this. When I'm having a hard time expressing my feelings and what I'm doing, I very often will actually instigate and invite an imaginary version of inside out and cast the characters and use that as a method actually in this. So that is a valid thing to do. It's one of the brilliance of that particular art form that inside out gave a lot of people is there is now full characters, voices and everything that they can add to their imagination for casting parts of their psyche into to help with that engagement, to help with the imagination side of the process. I, I can't prove it, but I have a feeling that the people involved in that were involved in internal family systems therapy. Probably. Because it feels like internal family systems therapy. Yeah. With one exception, we don't see Riley visit her own mind. Yeah. They don't do that part. That's, that's a big difference between it and IFS. Which, from the writer side, the creative process side, it, it's possible that they went, wait, the big shift is instead of Riley visiting their own mind, the audience visits their mind and fills in that role as of the self. I can see it. Okay, so how do you do it? Start with mindfulness meditation. There are various meditation means that are used to get yourself into a receptive state to enter active imagination. Mindfulness is pretty much the same kind of thing. You're wanting to calm yourself down, calm your mind down, and enter that mindful aware state. If you've already been practicing mindfulness and meditation, and since it's kind of ubiquitous nowadays, I feel like a lot of people have already done that. Center on your breath, on in a spot in front of you, in an external object or something. Focus in on that, clear your mind, relax, ease in, get to that place of awareness. However, works best for you. There are a lot of different techniques, but I think most people are familiar with mindfulness meditation. So start there. And once you enter into that place, normally you would continue to focus on your breath and stay in that mindful place. This is where active imagination veers off. Once you enter this place, you have a couple options. This is the first stage of active imagination, which is called the invitation. You can either sit in that blank space and invite your imagination to come forward. Now this can be specific, like you're struggling with a particular emotion and you can invite it to come forward. You're struggling with a particular problem. You can invite it to come forward or you can just blank slate it and just, if anybody needs to talk, come forward now. Let whatever comes forward, come forward. You can also construct a scene. Now this is a more advanced way to do it. It may seem simpler for you, but active imagination is not daydreaming. And until you get a good sense of how active imagination works, you could easily slip into just daydreaming. In daydreaming, you are in charge of the dream, right? You're sitting there, you're playing around in your imagination and then we do this and then we do that. And you're just daydreaming your way through it. Active imagination will feel outside of your control. You are giving up agency to parts of your psyche that don't normally communicate with you to communicate with you. So try in your early practice with this as much as possible to just invite whatever wants to come forward for. Now, you may be worried that maybe you have aphantasia and don't have the, a visual imagination. That doesn't matter. When I say invite something to come forward, it could be an image that comes into your mind. It could be a voice that comes into your mind. It could be a sensation that comes into your mind. So allow whatever to rise up to rise up. Now let it be as free as possible. Don't let it harm you. And remember, it's imaginary. When you're done, just tell it you're done and walk away. It is all in your mind. But let whatever comes up, come up. Here's where you have some paths you can take. How do you work best with your imagination? If you are an artist who likes to draw, paint, whatever, for everything going forward, draw, paint. I, I'm a writer and I very often will do my active imagination sometimes all in my head, but sometimes I will journal through my active imagination from this point on. Do what feels comfortable 
and most natural to you. I don't know how you would do this exactly with cooking or handicrafts or anything. I'll find myself sitting in the grove, basically sitting at a campfire with a pot over the fire that something is cooking in and either there is a conversation with some thing manifested for that aspect of whatever that I'm interacting with, or I'm just hanging out and interacting with whatever is cooking in the pot or cooking in the fire. So it's different. But for myself, that was how cooking would manifest. So once something has responded to the invitation, mm -hmm. and this may not happen on your first session, it may take you a while for your psyche to realize, oh, you're serious. If you've never done anything like this, if you didn't have imaginary friends as a kid, if you aren't somebody who spends a lot of time in your imagination, it may take some time for your imagination to trust you to come forward. If nothing comes forward, you journal your dreams when you wake up. There's a good chance your first experience is actually going to be in your dreams. This does have a tendency to either make your dreams more vivid or less vivid, depending on how the interaction goes. You might do a lot of that processing while you're awake instead of when you're asleep. So just bear that in mind, it may affect your dreams. If something doesn't come forward, again, pay attention to your dreams. It may come forward then. Or you may have something from a previous dream that you can't shake. And if nothing's coming forward on its own, try to bring that dream image up in this period of time. Okay? Now we're going to enter phase two, which is dialogue. Talk to it. Ask it questions. You can go into a full Socratic dialogue if you want to. You can talk to it like it's a friend. However feels most comfortable and natural to you with whatever you're engaging with. But you talk to it. And here's the hard part. Don't answer for it. This is the difference between active imagination and a daydream. And why active imagination often feels like magic. And it, it is a kind of magic. But it feels like you're dealing with something outside of you when you're not. You're giving space for your unconscious mind to talk to you, to interact with you. Now, it could be through dialogue. I've had active imagination sessions where I go in and I play on a drum and whatever I'm interacting with is playing a different instrument and we just kind of have a jam session together. I've had that happen. That is the dialogue phase. Pay very close attention to the dialogue phase, but don't worry about the dialogue phase. If it's not words, just pay attention to everything that's happening in here. Okay. And let your imagination do whatever it wants. Again, if you start feeling uncomfortable, it's your imagination. Tell it to stop, walk away. Okay. Now let the dialogue phase go on for whatever period of time you feel comfortable with. You may want to set a timer for yourself for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, what have you. Let it happen for the time that you feel that it needs to happen in. And immediately when you're done, whether you're a journaling person or not, we enter phase three. And I'm going to say this in the deepest part of my heart, write it down. Do not trust your memory to remember what happened to you during this process. Okay. So if you were out in the garden planting some plants and a big, beautiful sky dragon flies over and kind of circles around and starts singing a song. Write down, what did it look like? What was it doing? What shape was it taking when it was spinning around you? Did it say something? Write down what you remember it saying. Write it down, catalog it. Because this is where the actual power of active imagination comes in. You're now gonna put on your detective hat. Remember how I always say that magic is like science, it's all about experimentation? Well, you just did the experiment. This is where you collect your data and start analyzing it. Okay, I saw a beautiful sky dragon. Why? Why was it a dragon? Why did it have that shape it had? Why was it the color that it had? What, how did I feel about seeing it? What did it mean to me that I saw this, that, and the other? Why was I in a garden? What was I doing in the garden? Did the seeds have any meat? Start cataloging everything. Start taking it apart. Do not, whatever you do, go online or get yourself a book on symbolism and what it means. Do not. I don't care what these symbols mean to other people. The question is, what does it mean to you? If it's blue and you get angry when you see blue, then blue is an angry color to you, no matter what anybody in color theory says about blue being a calming color. If you see blue and it's angry, blue means angry to you in this context. Okay? And this is the process. Why did it look the way that it looked? Why, why did things happen the way that it happened? Why did it make a circle in the sky? Does that mean something to me? And you're teasing out. What are the symbols in here? What do they mean? How do they connect to me? If it gave you words, if it said things to you, 
How does that relate to the symbolism that you saw? For a lot of this is us, this is going to feel like going back to high school English class and dissecting a literary novel and writing an essay about it. Because that's really what you're doing here. You're trying to figure out what the symbolism is. What was your unconscious mind trying to communicate to you? It could be in the words that were spoken. It could be very plain. And if it is, you're very lucky. But those words, like somebody came and told you how much they loved you and how much you mean to this world and everything's wonderful. But it was a vampire who was staring at you hungrily. Well, see, depending on your feelings about vampires, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to take all of it into context. What does it mean? What do the symbols mean? This is why I said it can be really fun to do in groups. Now, you're not looking for the other people to tell you what the symbols mean, but they might remind you of, oh, yeah, remember that what you're saying sounds like this movie you used to like. Remember that movie? Da, da, was it like that character? And help you pull up some of those associations that you might not remember. And doing this for each other can be very helpful, very handy, and a really powerful experience. You don't have to do it in a group, but that's how groups can be helpful here. You're not trying to interpret each other's experience. You're trying to maybe ask those questions to help people dig down deeper into what they experience to pull out what the symbols are and what the symbols mean. Because you might have just seen a sack of seeds next to you and that might not mean anything to you but wait it was an hermes bag with seeds in it not a burlap bag well why did you have this really fancy expensive bag filled with seeds out in a garden you see what i'm saying it might not register to you as a, a strange occurrence that you should pay more attention to until you talk to somebody who helps to point that out you're pulling out all of the values you're pulling out what it means and then you're going to reconstruct that into figuring out what, what was the message here? What was my psyche trying to tell me? Active imagination works really well when you're trying to answer a specific question. That's why I said, if you have a specific question, remember back in invitation, ask it and see what comes up. It works best because you have the context in which all of this imagery and interaction took place in to use to help you understand, oh, that's what it was trying to tell me. Don't rush this period. Yeah, make sure you give yourself time, be patient. Especially if you don't have a specific question, if you're doing more of a free flow, open-ended, because sometimes the associations, the interpretation of the imagery takes time to make those connections where you go, oh, wait, that's right. That dragon was actually, looks exactly like this dragon over here, which is this, which I was in this emotional mental state when I experienced it, which means it's actually symbolizing Potato. I don't know. So, you know, it can be anything. It's your internal mind. It's, it really can be anything, <laughs> which is also why you really don't want to go looking into lists of what the symbolisms could be because those lists are going to just bias your thoughts. Give heavy weight to if it was a thing that you liked when you were a kid. Give heavy weight to, oh, that's a show that I used to watch or a book that I used to read or a comic that I used to love because those associations are important here and maybe something to be brought at. Okay. But once you figured out, what was it trying to communicate? Was it trying to tell me that I should be working on that novel that I was asking about, or I should be doing this, that, or the other thing? Once you feel like you have garnered whatever information was supposed to come out of it, that's when you enter phase four. Phase four, see yesterday's episode. Phase four is called rituals. You ritualize it. Now, what does that mean? That can be anything from, oh, I remembered how refreshed I used to feel when I got up and I used to wash my face when I was a kid and I would do it in a special way with the special soap that the scent really brought, brought me to life for me that would help calm me down in the morning and help me get my day started. Okay. Well, now you have a literal ritual that you should be doing, right? Figure out what the story is that it was trying to get you to enact. So it may be, I should write more. I should do this more. It may be, I need to honor my feelings about this particular thing. I need to let this thing go. How do you ritualize that? Maybe if you're supposed to let something go, you write that thing down on a piece of paper and burn it and throw it into your cauldron, let it burn away to ashes. Maybe you write it down and put it into a bowl of water so that it dissolves and dissolve the paper into the water and then go pour the water out. How do you ri ritualize the action? It could be as simple as actually performing the task, if it was a, oh, I should be doing this, I should not be doing this. If it's more 
esoteric. Like, oh, I really have been hard on myself and I need to love myself more. What's your favorite candy? What's your favorite treat? Buy yourself some, but don't just eat it. Sit down, make it special. Light yourself a candle. Have a moment with yourself where you slowly indulge in that treat and honor yourself in that treat and let yourself know how much you actually care if the message was you needed more self lars But ritualize, manifest it, make it real in your life somehow, either through an abstract ritual process or through just doing the thing. If you had your active imagination was, you know, I should, I, I, yeah, you're right, I should be walking more. I've been babying my injured knee or whatever, and I do have the strength that I could be going out for walks again, maybe I should be doing this. Then, you know, don't trust your imagination over your physicians or doctors. Never. That's not how this works. This is all inside your head, but you will start learning things about yourself. I'm being very vague because one, I don't want to share with the internet any of the deep experiences that I've had with active imagination because they were very personal and I want to keep them private. That's why I'm being very kind of vague about a lot of this. And the same with you, you're probably going to have experiences with this that are very personal to you. So when I'm saying it could be good to do this process with friends, if you don't feel comfortable with that, then don't do it with a friend. That is basically the process of active imagination. We calm our minds down. We invite the images to come forward. We have dialogue with them. We then catalog everything and seek out the value from the experience. And then we do a ritual. And the ritual has two functions. One, it is a way of actually doing whatever it is that we did. But even if it's something that we decide that we don't want to do or can't do, doing a ritual is a way of letting our unconscious mind, through enacting it, through embodying it, we're telling our unconscious mind, I heard you. You can still talk to me, but no. It's about ritual really does help us get in touch with and communicate to our unconscious systems. And that's it. Th those are the four stages of active imagination. This doesn't have to be a one-off. I'm just so you know. There are some people who lead an entire second life in their active imagination because in their real life, they're an office worker who does this particular thing. But, you know, in my heart of hearts, I would have been a Renaissance painter. And so their active imagination practice is them living that other life. They take a little bit of time every week, every day, and just enter this holodeck of the mind, whatever you want to call it, and live out that experience. And that's fine. But remember, the difference between daydreaming and active imagination is the level of agency you give to your imagination to speak from its own point, which is different from your conscious mind's perspectives. This is also a way that you will sometimes uncover some unconscious bias. It is a great tool for discovery, for learning a lot about yourself. It is extremely important to be honest with yourself through the process. If you want it to be effective, you have to be honest. And you're building that relationship with yourself, which is why, you know, once again, with all of the elements that comes with building relationship comes with this process as well. Yeah. So you got to be honest. You have to accept things as they are without judgment. Change can still happen, but you don't want to judge. That's for the later processes when you're evaluating and then ritualizing and letting the answer your unconscious and going, hey. Either okay or no, nah, not right now. But what about, about this? Which is part of that dialogue you're having with yourself. Now, I've worked hard in this episode to give you the most commonly used terms for the stages. If you go out and look at other resources, sometimes various practitioners and therapists have come up with their own jargon for the stages. I wish they hadn't, but I feel like if you do look up another book or source on this, you'll have the resources necessary to kind of, oh yeah, that's what Charlie was talking about for this, that, and the other state in here. Active imagination works really, really well when coupled with your dream work. One book that while I'm not co-signing everything that's in the, the book or this person in general, cause I don't know them that well, that I read not that long ago was inner work using dreams and active imagination for personal growth by Robert A. Johnson. I don't think you need a book for this. I think once you know the basics of the technique, it kind of is something you can just do. If you are wanting more examples, he does use 
a lot of examples of other people's active imagination and dream work in here. I feel like this book is the podcast that you just listened to and a whole bunch of examples thrown in. So if that's something that you're looking for, you just want a bunch of examples on how this works, how people do this, then it's a decent book to go to. I found the book to be fairly practical about it. It's very like, here, here's how you do dream work. Here's how you do active imagination. Here's how other people have done it. It's fairly straightforward and to the point, but there are a lot of resources out there on active imagination that can really help you out. Alrighty. So I hope that this was everything that you were looking for, especially for those of you who asked for this episode to come out. We haven't done a lot of these kind of how to episodes really like this, this very detailed step-by-step how to for things. If you want us to do more of those, do let us know and what you'd like us to do them on because we're here to help the community and to help it grow. And if you do start trying active imagination, I would love to know if it's actually helping you out because I've had a very good experience with this throughout my life and I, I love the practice. So have you tried active imagination before? Is this the first time you're hearing about it? If you asked us to do this episode, is this the episode that you wanted? Let me know in the comments. If you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they tell you that you can leave a comment there, they don't notify us, so we won't know. But leave a comment there anyway, because, yeah, engagement is magic. And then go over to creationspass.com and click on chat, and you can leave a comment there, and we will be able to see it and be able to respond back to you. While you're over there, if you have a few dollars to help us out, you can sign up for our membership. You can also support us on Kofi or Patreon. I am CE Dorset on both. And that money just helps us keep the lights on, keep a roof over our head and food on our table. So thank you to anybody who can do that. If you don't have any money, don't worry about it. I understand. But if you know anybody that you think would like any of the episodes that we've done, just share those with them. That helps us out a lot. Alrighty. Thank you so very, very much. I always end these with a prayer and... I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to say a prayer to me that maybe you can use for yourself. So to my fetch, my co-walker, who has walked with me all the days of my life, who will be with me until the day that I leave this life, whose secret name that I know but do not say aloud to others, help me as I go on the journeys into myself to learn more about the vast landscape and the many worlds that exist within me so that I may be better at being myself and better engaged in this world around us so that we can, in the end, make the universe the grand and glorious place that it wants to be. Amen. Amen. Amen.